Dr. Caroline, let us serve ourselves and we pray. Loving Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessed week you have given us. Father, as we are going to do this RCME on our postpartum, Father, may you uh, provide us with wisdom and knowledge. Father, we place our facilitators who are going to take us this module. That may you guide them so that you can give us uh, some of the things which we can do to improve on the postpartum uh, period, Father. Father, also we place uh, all those uh, doctors who are joining on this call. May you provide them with a proper and clear network so that you can listen in in order to learn more about postpartum. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for leading us through that word of prayer. Um, a warm welcome to every one of us. Thank you for making time to be a part of this CME. Uh, my name is Dr. Caroline Oleo. I am a gynecologist working with Chavira Surgical Center, which is found in Budondo, Bujagali, that is in Jinja District. Um, the reason why we are here today is to look at the advances in prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage, which we know is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality and morbidity worldwide. And we actually know that um, more than 75%, 75 to 90% of this hemorrhage is due to uterine atony. Uh, we also know that um, even with the best prenatal care, postpartum hemorrhage can still occur, even in a woman without any risk factors. And we also know that uh, most of this postpartum hemorrhage, actually the mortality and morbidity is mainly in the, in the rural, in, I mean in the low and middle income countries. So this remains an elephant in the room, uh, basically for us. And today we are here to talk about this, to learn about the advances in the prevention and management um, uh, we are very honored today to have dr musana to take us through this cme uh, but before i invite him to take us through i'll just briefly talk about usoga health forum uh, this is mainly for the benefit of people who are joining us for the first time or people who do not know much about Wusoga Health Forum. But then for those that know, it's also to remind us about what Wusoga Health Forum is. So Wusoga Health Forum is an association of like-minded people and professionals stimulating community, government, and partner actions for better health of the people. It is a national, not-for-profit voluntary membership-based organization headquartered in the heart of Busoga, which is Ginger City. Um, Busoga Health Forum works in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, local governments, and civil society organizations to coordinate health interventions through established technical working groups and technical administrative structures, including district health teams and formal and non-formal community structures. Busoga Health Forum, therefore, is a think tank generating evidence to drive health policy action to improve the health and development of individuals in Busoga and beyond. The vision of this forum is a healthy, thriving Busoga, and the mission is to rally Busoga professionals to use evidence to engage community, government, and partner action for better health of children, youth, and women youth, women, and men in Busoga. The core values are value addition, uh, collaboration and integration, impact focus, transparency and accountability, effectiveness and efficiency. And the core program areas of this forum are reproductive, maternal newborn, child and adolescent health, malaria, HIV and TB, regional planning and data use, infectious and non-communicable diseases, as well as urban health. So this is to urge and encourage anyone who, has not yet, who is not yet part of this forum to be part of the efforts to improve health in Busoga. Um, subscription can be made annually. Individuals, it's 100,000. 
and for institutions it's 500,000 but then you can also pay lifetime membership um, of 1 million shillings. Um, so with that I would like to say a few things about um, Dr. Musana who is actually here to to take us through this CME session. Um, Dr. Othniel Musana is a consultant gynecologist practicing and residing in Uganda. He earned his medical degree from Makere University, Kampala in 2005 and completed obstetrics and gynecologist specialist training at the Mother Kevin Postgraduate Medical School at the Uganda Matters University. That was in 2013. He attained a Master of Public Health degree at the University of Manchester, that was in 2013, and Gynecology Super Speciality Fellowship Training at the Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, India, that was in 2019. He's a strong advocate for improved access to oncology services, training and research in Uganda. The majority of his free time is spent reading leadership texts, exercising in the nearest gyms and engaging in healthcare policy debate. He has more than 17 years experience as a medical doctor with special interest in leadership, mentorship, underserved populations, health-related advocacy, and private sector medical business. Um, he's the current president of AUGU, which is the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Uganda, that is from 2021 to 2023. And previously, he served as head of department of obstetrics and gynecology at St. Francis Hospital in Zambia, where he also serves as consultant gynecologist. Um, his time as AUGU president has seen growth in the number of competent and motivated AUGU membership, a rise in AUGU research and program grants, development of national guidelines in reproductive health, advocates to improve training opportunities in obstetrics and gynecology, growth of the regional AUGU chapters, startup and growth of the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee, and a significant reduction in the maternal mortality ratios as reported in the UDHS 2022. He has given a number of keynote national addresses as an invited keynote speaker in areas of abortion, teenage pregnancy, cancer care in Uganda. He's an ardent researcher and health policy analyst with keen interest in human resources for health, health system and uh, health systems and services design. And with that, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Musana, to this CME. Thank you for accepting this invite. And I would like to hand over to you to take it on from here. We are all here to listen to you. Thank you. Dr. Musana, Hello, we can't Dr. hear you. Musana. You could change the microphone, maybe, of one of your gadgets. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Sorry, sorry about that. I was saying that uh, in the face of the new guidelines being released by the ministry and the NASMIC PPH subcommittee, led by our colleague, Dr. Ononge, it's important for us as a region or as doctors to have some insight into what's happening that would be advances in how we manage P sorry, PPH in Uganda, but also worldwide. Uh, remember, I'm a gyno-oncologist, not a obstetrician gynecologist, so I prefer to be called gyno-oncologist. However, when they when they are stuck in managing the PPH, 
usually they will call me to deliver some of the surgical aspects of managing the PPH. So that's where I come from in terms of my experience. So let us just go back as a, a reminder about pregnancy. So we have what we call ECF, that's the volume of fluid outside the cells. In pregnancy, it will increase by almost 50%. So it will almost become 1.5 times before the level of pregnancy. The mother's blood volume will actually increase by between 1.2 liters to 1.6 liters. And a significant amount of this is actually plasma volume. Plasma is the fluid part of the blood that increases up to 60%. Now, this increase is supposed to help the woman maintain her blood volumes, maintain her blood pressure, but also ensure the placenta and the uterine interface has enough blood to sustain the pregnancy throughout the course of pregnancy. So in a normal weight range woman, you will find that uh, she has about 65 to 85 mils of plasma. That is the liquid part of the blood per kilogram. But in pregnancy, this may go up to 200 mils, may almost double, 200 mils per kilogram of plasma volume for that pregnancy. Now, if the higher you, you go in BMI, the higher the rise in this. Just a social reminder as to why this topic is very important to us is that uh, blood is a structure, blood is an organ, and blood is the most commonly transplanted organ, if I can say, because we do more transfusions than say replacing any other organ of the body. And of course the blood has anatomy. So the blood is a structure. It has red blood cells which transport oxygen. And if you lose your red blood cells from bleeding, you will affect oxygen transport and become hypo hypoxic or low oxygen saturation. And the cells will starve of oxygen. We have white blood cells which fight infection. So of course, if you, if you bleed significantly, you're at risk of infection, you have to give you antibiotics. So women who have a PPH must be on oxygen, even if the pulse oximeter is reading 100. They are already hypoxic, so give them oxygen. Then of course, the other cells in there are the platelets, which are ones responsible for making the, the blood clots, the initial blood clots. Now, if the platelets are used up, the woman just continues to bleed. So it's in the interest of the team managing to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. Then of course, we have the non-cellular components and among them is the plasma. Basically perfusion means carrying something like the river Nile will perfuse and perfuse the gardens in, in Egypt and irrigate them and stuff like that. So if there's no plasma, you cannot carry the cells and the proteins to where they're supposed to be used. So plasma, is normally the first thing we replace as we manage PPH. That's why we normally give saline and other fluids. So the consequences are shock. And because plasma is the one which carries body heat, if you have no plasma in PPH, you will become hypothermic. So women must be warmed. Then of course, plasma carries red blood cells. If it's not flowing, <clears throat> you get hypoxia, even if this pulsoximeter may show you 100%. Plasma is what carries blood to the kidneys. So if there is no plasma, you tend to get kidney injury. So the earlier you replace the plasma, the better for the kidneys. And if you don't replace plasma well, of course, you'll get the multiple organ dysfunction. Then we have proteins. Specifically for this topic, we have what we call the clotting factors. If you don't manage them well, then they also will lead to more, more bleeding. Hence, PPH will always cause more PPH. Now, let me first pause a bit for many of the members on this forum. Women who survive PPH, some of them will die, but those who survive, they have risks. And in my clinic at Insambia, I tend to see what we call Sheehan syndrome. The woman bleeds a lot, but she remains alive. Because she has bled, there is no plasma to, to take blood, blood cells to the, to the brain as a vital organ. Now, the brain has a small organ called the pituitary gland, which controls almost all our hormone production in the body. And so if that organ fails to get oxygen for about three to five minutes, the cells in the organ which produce the hormones begin to die. That is what we call Sheehan syndrome. So 
survivors of PPH may actually come back with many other problems. They may fail to breastfeed, no breast milk. They may come back with problems in menstruation, either there's no menstruation or there is little bleeding from, from what used to happen before they became pregnant. They may come with issues with anemia. They may come with issues of weakness and thyroid disease, depending on the extent of, of uh, PPH. So don't just save the woman for now and say, oh, she's alive. Even later, they may come back with hormone or endocrine problems that may affect their quality of life. So that is the pause I want to give people that it's not just now because you've discharged and she's talking. She will get problems later. So, of course, the uterus has a blood supply, and the blood supply comes from the uterine arteries there, which come from the arteries and feed the uterus. The second blood supply of the uterus comes from the ovarian arteries, which come from the ovary, and they form a linkage with the uterine vessels along the uterus there, that area I'm touching. So in that way, if you cut off blood supply from the uterine vessels here, the uterus can still survive because blood will come through the ovaries to nourish it. So people, when you're doing surgery, sometimes cut off these vessels. So don't worry much as long as this one is still active and not damaged. If you cut off both of them there and there, then you have usually killed the uterus. So, naturally speaking, the uterus has ways of controlling bleeding. The uterus, which is not pregnant, that is in during menstruation, behaves the same way as a woman, as the uterus, which is pregnant during and after delivery. So the mechanisms which are used to control bleeding are the same for both cases. And in the science, we use these mechanisms to manipulate how we shall manage PPH as we shall see in the subsequent part of the presentation. So the first mechanism, the uterus has blood vessels, which bring blood to the uterus. As we had seen there, those, those ones which enter the uterus there, from the arteries. The arteries have thick walls. The walls are thick. They have muscle within their walls. So as soon as, they, you re, as soon as you remove the placenta, the arteries, the muscles constrict, they contract, and the vessels close. Otherwise, if they fail to close, you keep on the veins designed a system which is almost like we think where the vessel weaves itself through the muscles Yes, so we saw about Dr. Dropping. We are making sure he gets back.
Doctor, we're still having the same issue. Yeah. Your network is still down. As we wait for Doctor to come back on, I'd like to welcome all those that are just joining us. Um, thank you for making it to the presentation. Uh, we are doing our best to make sure that Doctor gets back online. Um, let's be patient, and we thank you so much for being a part of this CME. Benjamin? Yes, Dr. Dr. Musana is back on. Yeah, he's back and um, uh, he's going to use his phone and I'll share the screen. Okay. Yes, Dr. Mason, the screen is ready. You can pick it. Dr. Thompson, you can now unmute and present.
Ah, so sorry. I'm back on. Yes, doctor, you can hear. Hear me. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yes, I think I had moved on a few slides ahead. I was on slide um, slide slide eight. The slide after. Yes. So I said the veins cannot contract, so the uterines, uterine muscles contract. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the muscles contract to slow the vessels bleeding and the clots form. Please, next slide. Next one. Next one. So I would like to explain why women die so we can move on to the next slide. So one of the things members should know is for the slide before, please. The slide before with the table. That one, yes. So one of the issues members should be aware that for every minute in the uterus, almost 700 mils of blood go through the uterus. So if a woman has postpartum hemorrhage, she can lose up to 700 mils of blood every single minute. So it means in about seven minutes, she can have lost all her blood volume. So just don't, just don't forget about that, that once she begins bleeding, within about five minutes, she's bled out. Two, if you don't control the bleeding, she will lose almost 1.2 liters in about two minutes. Of, of, of bleeding not controlled. In three minutes, she'll have lost almost half, 2.5 liters of blood. And in three min in five minutes, she'll have lost 75%, which is almost 3.7 liters of blood. And if you do nothing, if you do nothing, she will have lost about 5,000 mils, which is the average amount of blood for women at nine months during pregnancy. She'll have lost all of it in seven minutes. Now. The challenge with this is that we cannot estimate blood loss accurately, so we must act very, very quickly to make sure we have a window of about 10 minutes to stop this bleeding at the earliest opportunity. We can move on. We can move on, please. Next slide. So on this slide, I just try to make health workers understand that their tools matter. Now, imagine you have a basin which is leaking at the bottom. So leaking at the bottom, you'll see somewhere at the right-hand corner bottom, the rate of blood loss. Now, many health workers actually aid the women in dying because they tend to put on small bore cannulas. Imagine a tap, you're replacing a drop, but you're losing an ocean down here. So small, small cannulas will cause problems. So it is better you use a large bore cannula, which is almost giving you as much replacement as the fluid loss at the bottom when the woman has PPH. So you find people, next slide. People like to use the cannulas below, the purple one, the yellow one, because they say, ah, but this one is easy to put in the vein, the blue one and the pink one. Now, what you don't understand and I have circled the cannulas you should use. In Uganda, we have the green and the gray. And in the other column where you see another square, column four, you will see the water flow through a cannula. If I'm putting up saline, how much am I putting in per minute? If I open that cannula, if I open the giving set fully, for the yellow one, for the, for the purple one at the bottom, it is only 13 mils a minute. Now compare that with the gray one, which is giving you 180 mils a minute. So if I am losing 700 mils a minute, and for you you're replacing 13 mils a minute, it means you have ideally told me you can die. So some people don't die because the health worker did not do something. They die because they chose the wrong tools of trade. So 
we recommend the gray cannulas or the green cannulas. Now, the gray cannula is 180 mils per minute, but you're losing 700. So it means every minute the deficit. So if you're putting 180 and I'm losing 700, you have a deficit of about 500 mils every minute. So in one minute, half a liter. Two minutes, you'll be losing now. You'll have, have a deficit of one liter. So make sure you put two cannulas, which are large bore, and make sure that if you have the 180 gray cannula, if you have two of them, at least you're replacing close to 400 mils versus what she's losing us, maybe half a liter. So you're almost matching the deficit. Otherwise, if you keep managing with the small cannulas, she'll bleed out and she will still die. Next slide, please. So your choice of tool matters, but also there's something else among health workers we have found. One of them is they don't prepare themselves to manage PTH, but they know it will happen. We know women will bleed, but we are never prepared. Now the new guidelines tell you to prepare a PPH kit. Two, there is a delay in detecting PPH because most of our health workers work alone. At center three, one midwife managing almost the whole unit. Center four, one midwife managing theater, labor ward, postnatal ward. So of course women will die because there's a delay in detecting PPH. In more advanced centers, where there are theaters like center for hospitals, there is a delay in deciding to move from the first line, which is medicines, oxytocin, to surgical procedures, which may save the woman's life. So what the guidelines don't normally say is when do you make the decision to move on to the second line? So the lack of actionable guidelines becomes a problem to health workers. You can move on. Next slide, please. The one before. The one before. Please move backwards, that one. Now, a PPH kit looks like that. What we call emergency PPH kit. It has cannulas, sample bottles, syringes, and it should be set aside as the ministry says in the guidelines. So don't start managing a woman with PPH and you begin running around looking for needles, looking for bottles, looking for catheter, drainage bag, looking for gloves, looking for drugs. No, that kit must be set aside just like a PPA, just like the PAT kit is set aside. Now the drugs which must be there, this one they think they'll share it with you so you can prepare yourselves for PPH before it even happens. Some of the drugs we need there are oxytocin. I have put in red cabetocin because now the guidelines have cabetocin. Oxytocin goes in a fridge. Cabetocin can stay on the shelf. It is heat stable, doesn't require refrigeration. And you can choose either. And the minimum you require is five ampules. You must have misoprostol in this kit. For us who work in the city and at some levels of referral like regional referral hospitals, they've now been allowed to have Carboprost. Carboprost is like misoprostol, but faster acting and uninjectable. Then, of course, tranexamic acid should be given to all levels from center three all the way to national referral. So that is the PPH kit, which is one of the advances which has happened in Uganda, and health workers must be familiar. In terms of syringes, you must have some 10 mil syringes, at least four, five mil, at least two, and then two mils. And the list goes on. That you can read later. Move on. So, next slide. Now, what are the advances really that have changed? Of course, there are tools like arm still, active management of that type of labor, give oxytocin, give, I'll focus on a few things. Normally, when you have PPH, they normally tell us to do bimanual compression, what you see on the diagram there. One hand is fixing the fixed to the vagina, and the other hand is above this, the pubis. The purpose is to squeeze the two walls of the uterus together. And by squeezing them together, they create their own tunicate, like tamponade, and the bleeding reduces. Now, many of the advances have tried to copy this method using uh, newer, newer techniques. So whatever you will see below is trying to ensure that the two walls of the uterus at least are either touching each other 
or there is something that is pressing against those walls to prevent or to put pressure on those walls to prevent further bleeding. Next slide. So, in Uganda recently, now we have what we call the, the Elavi balloon. Elavi is uterine balloon tamponant. It costs about 70,000 shillings. It has been used in Zambia uses it and clinics used in the private practice. So that balloon goes inside the uterus and you feel that bug, the bug that a bug, when the balloon fills up and covers the tears, then the bleeding will stop. It will begin to push the water back into that is the third, uh, that is in the third, the third illustration down there. As it contracts, the water goes, starts going back into the, into the bag as, as it was pushed there before. So we have the lavy balloon. It is cheap and I'm, I think health facilities should have this balloon on their PPH trolley or tray and in theater. Next slide, please. The, one is, the other one is called the Bakuri Balloon. Now the Bakuri Balloon is very expensive. I think it's about $120. That is almost uh, about half a million shillings. So generally not affordable for a Ugandan or for the government. So I would still recommend that if you have the chance, use the Lavi Balloon for those who can afford. But I'm sure that from center four should have these balloons. They're easy to use and can be then used by midwives at center three as they're referring these women. Don't refer a bleeding woman. Refer a woman whose bleeding is being controlled at least by a balloon, or if you're doing by manual, if you're doing by manual compression. That balloon can also still be used at cesarean section. So if you're at Caesar, there is attorney, you put the balloon in, this can be explained later, but that option exists for the obstetricians and the medical officers. When the bleeding has settled, all you do is remove the suture on the top and pull out the balloon. Decompress the balloon and pull it out. Next slide, please. Next slide. In Uganda, we I think our personal, I would still recommend using the condom tamponade. It is not standard, but it is what we may have. You have this condom, put it in the uterus around the neck of a forest catheter, and then pass water through a balloon in that system to go into the uterus. Clean water. Please don't, don't refer a woman who is bleeding. By the time she reaches, she will have bled out. Do something, and the balloon tamponade or condom tamponade can sort that out. The other issue, of course, is the negative pressure. Now, I'll spend some time here, if I'm allowed. Negative pressure means you're sucking something. Like you put a straw in a bottle of soda and suck. You're creating a vacuum in the straw and thereby sucking out everything. So the principle here is the same principle we use in the manual vacuum aspiration, MVA. You make a vacuum, put in your cannula, attach the syringe, release the vacuum, it sucks out things. And that is how bleeding stops. The difference here is that uh, the suction is a bit of is, a, is continuous, not like the MVA. But this method was des, was designed after the MVA. We can move on. Can move on. Please next slide. So, it is a very simple thing to use. This is equipment we have in our facilities. I've moved to Center Falls Hospitals. They have vacuum, they have suction machines. You attach a tube, you can even use a, you can use an MVA cannula, the large one, put in the uterus and switch on the vacuum machine. It will first suck out the blood. After the blood is finished, it will then suck out the remaining, it will, it will then suck the walls of the uterus together and the walls will compress each other without you having to go to theater. So 
If you have a virtual mat in the facility, please use it. Next slide. This other device, the same like same principle, but this one is a modern one. It was done in Uganda for, as, for a pilot and it worked. If you do it correctly, within about five seconds, you have normal bleeding if you have the right suctions. So when you put it in the uterus, the walls collapse on each other and create their own tamponade or pressure and the woman stops bleeding without having the need to do surgery. Next one. Now, surgical methods. Usually, I'll speak about the ones which are used to avoid removing the woman's uterus. These are normally quick, especially for young women like in Busoga who desire fertility. So, again, their purpose is to cause compression of the two walls of the uterus together, just like the bimanual, bimanual compression. They are simple to learn. The MOs can do them. They are life saving. They are safe. Very few side effects. And they save the woman a hysterectomy, but also the MOS hysterectomy that may cause damage. So what you do using sutures, like in the diagram there, you can see a suture goes around the uterus and compresses the two walls together, thereby causing bleeding to stop. They are very quick. Half an hour, you're done, and you're out of theater. We can move on, please. And of course, lately there have been new medicines that have come around. Move on, please. The new ones are the two I spoke about, cabetocin, which looks like, which which was which which looks like oxytocin, but can be stored at room temperature, meaning it is heat stable. So much as we are saying, uh, oxytocin is still the number one drug. Please keep some cabetocin because sometimes the fridges don't work and our oxytocin may not be available in the quality we need it. The other one is carboprost, use it. Then of course, the last thing I like to talk about, what is happening now, many of you have heard about the local maternity and newborn systems. Those are at regional level, at the level of the region. Those are the teams at the region, which help us to maintain quality in terms of managing things like PPH and other things like preeclampsia. Now, now, at the, at the facility, there is a concept called the clinical microsystem. This is the smallest team of people who work together to provide patient services and actually ensure that women don't die of deaths. So that team of the medical officer, the nurse, the cleaner, the patient attendant, the admin supports, the support person in the admin, the lab, is called the microsystem. Now, we are promoting, and move on, please. Move on. That system is where the patients, families, care teams, and information actually interact together. So that team is very important, and it is where quality, safety, outcomes, and the satisfaction all come to be put. Let's move on, please. Let's move on. So as we are promoting the local maternity networks, let us look at also the team managing the woman. One midwife cannot manage a PPH. The woman will die. One MO can't manage alone. The woman will die. So that team consists of doctors, nurses, midwives, anesthetic officers, and other clinicians. But also, don't leave the clinicians alone. We also have administrative support, like the admins, the EDs who support these teams. And we have, of course, information. Some patients come with attendance, and of course, this helps the health worker. So that team must be managed to enable to ensure that PPH is managed. So that team must have a, a good quality control, sorry, good quality improvement purpose. The patients must receive the right information. In that team, there is no inferior job. Everybody is important. And for example, like at Insandia with PPH, you may find the SHO is telling the senior consultant, you go and pick blood. And I'll go and pick blood. They must have processes and must be well-trained. And of course, they must have the discipline and the patterns to deliver the services. So the innovations and the advances that have come out lately, just to summarize, we have this.
we have the non-surgical methods, like the balloon tamponades, which must be there all the time. We have the surgical methods, like the compression sutures. Then we also have now the clean brain actually managed. So if a mother dies, it's not the problem of the doctor and nurses alone. It's a problem of the lab, a problem of also the administrator or the MS. I will beg to stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Musana, for the presentation. It was quite detailed. I have learned a lot from what you have presented. Um, I would like to open up uh, the, the room for room for questions um, so that uh, doctor is available to answer any questions. And as uh, people come up with questions, uh, I've seen two questions in the chat by Beatrice. Uh, and one of them is she's requesting that you explain Sheehan syndrome again. Uh, she also was asking what fluid, what is the fluid of choice? I think this is with regard to resuscitation. Yeah, those are the two questions. Uh, probably, Doctor, you could answer those as we get more questions. So the fluid of choice usually is ringer's lactate. However, in Uganda, we somehow tend to order for only normal saline, but the two can work. But ringer's lactate is normally the preferred fluid for this kind of this disorder. Now, Sheehan's syndrome, Sheehan's. So when your mother bleeds a lot, when a mother bleeds a lot, the body, the body mechanisms try to conserve the blood flow to the vital organs which support life. Now the key organs are the heart, the liver, and the brain. But in the brain, the body also tries to conserve most of the blood flow to the bigger parts of the brain so that they don't die. Now, any part of the brain which is which is fed by capillaries, because when you close off the capillaries and the arteries, the blood fails to go to those organs. Now, the, the gland in the brain responsible for reproduction is called the pituitary gland, pituitary gland. And it's only the blood flow there is made up of capillaries. Now, those capillaries shut down because there's no blood reaching that gland. So that gland, the cells there, because of hypoxia, they begin to die or they begin to go undergo necrosis. And if this is not if, if this is not stopped very quickly, those cells die off completely. Now, those are the cells which secrete what we call the releasing hormones that control reproduction, that control the thyroid and other organs like the adrenals. For example, the pituitary secretes prolactin for breastfeeding, secretes oxytocin. So if it is not if it's not working, then you likely get um, you likely get more bleeding if you have um, PSH that controls the thyroid may also become a challenge. So you'll have hypothyroidism and sometimes you get issues with the parathyroids as well. If you lose your pituitary, also the things like FSH and LH, which control your reproduction as a woman will get destroyed and of course you will have problems in reproduction. We actually have some forms of infertility. So that's what the Sheehan syndrome. But we may come back later with life. I am not sure so, if she understood it. Yes. Um yes it was a clear explanation. Um um, thank you so much, Doctor. I see quite a number of questions here. Um, Mugole Hamidu is asking, I saw distilled water on the PPH kit. How do we use it? Um, maybe I can also say, uh, uh, give you another question. Which suture do we use for the compression sutures? We, for the sutures, uh, we use Vicryl 1. Vicryl 1 is the suture of choice for the uterus or Vicryl 0. So, okay. yes. I don't know what the distilled water is for, 
but normally it is normally used to wash instruments that may have been removed maybe from Sidex or something like that. Okay. Um, um, Mbolwa is asking um, if I use negative pressure suction, how do I tell that it's being effective? And if not, when do I stop? So the story of that discovery happened in, in uh, Malaysia. A woman had PPH and the doctor, then obstetrician, remembered that they were doing a lot of MVAs, second trimester MVAs. And so he put in a suction, he put in a cannula, the large, the large cannula, I think size 12, and attached a suction machine and then switched, the can, switched on the suction machine to 70 millimeters of mercury. Those machines have gradations there. And within about two seconds, there was no more bleeding. So the, the, the suction will not cause contraction, but it will cause the walls of the uterus to compress each other. And as, you research, as the woman recovers and research states, within about an hour, that uterus will have contracted without you having to even give drugs in some of the cases. So the suction is meant to empty the uterus make a vacuum in the uterus. When you make a vacuum, it will suck the walls, just like the way you suck on a straw and your cheeks go inside. And the walls collapse and the walls provide their own tamponade and stop bleeding. So the contraction, so as you keep checking over the next maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, there'll be no bleeding from downstairs, from the vaginal canal, but as you keep on setting the woman, you'll find that the uterus begins to contract. So the purpose of the suction is to collapse the walls. Now, contraction is, means you have to resuscitate the woman, to give energy to the muscles to contract. Yeah. But these are very okay. good techniques to use. Don't allow a woman to go. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Maybe when I'm in Bosoga, I'll give a demonstration. Okay, that will be very, very great. We shall be grateful for that. Um, Christopher is asking, are there a lab Somebody asked reusable? about tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid is, yeah. uh, helps to reduce. Well, it is. They say it is. They say they say it is single use. Sorry, Elavi is marketed as single use, but it is made of silicon, not rubber. So sometimes we can reuse it if, it, if, 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 you, if you have things like Sidex, but also we told the manufacturers to try and make it autoclavable. So then, then they're now discussing with the government or the Minister of Health and NMS to see if they can be, can be put on the essential list of uh, items for PPH management. Okay. Yeah. Uh, before, before I miss this, someone is asking, what's the dose of carboplast? Jennifer is asking. Carboplast, 250 micrograms, MCG. Okay. And carboplast will stop bleeding in about four, five seconds if used immediately. Okay. So carboplast and uh, misoprostol are in the same class of drugs, it's injectable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Fahad is asking any role for vasopressors? Um, any role for, for, for vasopressors like adrenaline or, or adrenaline? No, the vasopressors are now used to manage the shock when we think that uh, fluids and other things have failed to reverse your shock. So we give adrenaline in an HDU or ICU setting to support the heart to make sure that. Uh, that uh, the heart keeps beating. However, we don't use it for preventing PPH, but we use it for managing the complications of PPH. One of them is the intractable sh shock and the 
the issues around the heart. Okay. Um, um, as, I, as we continue to go through these questions in the chat, I also want to request anyone who can raise their hand to ask any questions directly uh, to Dr. Musana. Please feel free to raise your hand, unmute, and proceed. Anyone? As I wait, Philip Komakech is asking for how many minutes should I watch the uterus after B lynch before closing the abdomen or considering proceeding to the next step if B lynch fails? The maximum is 20 minutes. Okay. If it has failed, just proceed with hysterectomy, 20 minutes. Okay. Any questions, please, please feel free to raise your hand. Please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, somebody asked about cabetosin to treat or prevent. Cabetosin is only licensed in the guidelines to prevent PPH, not to treat PPH. But you must be aware that the drug exists. So in case you don't have oxytocin to prevent PPH, you can use cabetosin. Okay. Caroline, I have my hand up. Yes, 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 uh, Julius. Please okay, go thank ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Neil, for the presentation. Uh, mine is just, uh, I think, an appeal from the public health perspective of uh, PPH management. Uh, one of the key gaps we are noticing in our practice of late is uh, the doctors are well conversant with the, all the management of PPH, but unfortunately they are lacking that responsiveness and risk identification for postpartum hemorrhage. So my, I think, request as a person probably training them currently is to find a way of instilling that uh, responsibility and responsiveness to managing PPH because one of the key gaps is they don't respond when called by the nurses and somehow they even don't have the kit ready to manage PPH in their wards and yet they are the custodians number one of management of PPH. That's something I wanted to say. Thank you. Back to Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Um, Thank you, Julius. Um, Beatrice had her hand up. I don't know if you changed your mind. Beatrice, <laughs> you had your hand up. Okay, uh, Richard. Yes, Richard. Please go ahead and ask your question. Caroline, Richard, and thank you so much, Dr. Musala. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you so much. Any I'm other not questions? Really far so much from what you hear. Richard, we have yes, lost we can you. Hear. Okay. Okay, should, should I now? Sorry, I think my network is a bit bumpy, but I, I hope I'm now audible. Yes, you are audible. Richard, please go ahead with your question. Okay, so I was asking if I'm now audible. My network is a bit really funny because of where I am. Wait. We can hear you. We can hear okay. you. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying that. Thank you so much from what Julius has said. I want to thank Dr. Musana so very much for a very good presentation. Sometimes when we make this presentation to us, the medical people, they make a lot of sense, um, basically in terms of the science and the technical knowledge. 
But when it comes to implementation, you find that there's a lot of things that need to be done in the political world and into, into the administrative world. I don't know from where Dr. Musana sits or stands and the, exper and the experience you've had moving around facilities in some of these things implemented on the ground, that when mothers come in, they get this support, they get this help. On Thursday, we had presentations moderated by the commission of MCH at Minister of Health. And it was very painful to see mothers dying because, I mean, the health workers can't do much about it. You get comments like shortage of blood, oxygen, got out, sorry, oxygen stockouts, things which we really take for granted, or even lack of ambulances, which we take for granted, but will keep leading to many of our mothers dying. So Dr. Musana, could you please speak to some of the things we can do in the advocacy side to see that some of these things you're talking about are actually practical and being done? Thank you very much and sorry for the mouthful. Thank you, thank you, Richard. I think most of the time we have spent as AOGU has been to advocate. One of the things we have asked the ministry, but even as we go in the regions, is in our meetings we invite the cows and also invite the DHOs, but also invite the directors of hospitals or the medical superintendents to actually take part in the audits when we go there to do them. Because sometimes we do those confidential inquiries take part and, and make them understand what their role is in making sure the woman doesn't die. And in some areas, it has led to improvements in care. That also said, uh, a, a big chunk of this of the, of the challenge has come from the leadership from the doctors themselves. We consider sometimes ourselves just as workers, but not as leaders and advising in, in terms of procurement and a few other processes. So, when we move out normally for advocacy, of course we make, we throw stones everywhere. We target the political leaders in those meetings. So if you go up north, you're targeting political leaders from other DCs to directors, to the MSAs, to even the blood bank has to come and tell us why the woman died and why they did not have blood. So advocacy continues, but I think as Bosoga region, now, now the ministry has begun the local maternity and newborn systems. And on those ones, we have told them that they must include the key decision makers, that when a woman dies, people like the car or people like the LC5, the RDC must be involved in the audit and tell us why some of those things are not happening and why the health workers are not being supported in a way that these women end up dying. But also there are small, small issues. Uh, one of the issues I think, uh, I don't know, it's called presentism or absent, I'm not sure, absentism. Uh, many of the health workers, I think many of the health workers I've visited have burnt out. Have actually burnt out because they never get rest. So you'll find that when problems happen, their response is slow because they have burnt out. So generally the advocacy for us on the advocacy side we normally target the decision makers and make them accountable for those debts. And I'm sure with the local maternity network systems, if that can then get down to the clinical micro systems, then the advocacy will become much better because I cannot blame a health worker for a woman dying because there is no blood and there's no transport. That means somebody has to account what is the transport. So I agree with you, my brother, that we will need to step this up and uh, I think if you come to the LGU conference, there's a, there's a presentation about the pathways um, on how women die that will be presented. And I think this will serve as our advocacy tool. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Musana. Um, our time is fast spent. Um, there are quite a number of, of Good messages here, thanking you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, um, there are still questions that are unanswered, but time may not allow us to, to answer all of them. Um, 
I may maybe just take just one last question before we close. Um, anyone who can raise their hand, just one last question as we close. Any last question? Maybe I'll just pick one randomly from here. Um, someone was asking if carboprost can be given within the myometrium. Maybe if you could answer that, doctor, as we close, because our time is fast spent. No, I, th I think uh, give those habits of giving carboprost oxytocin into the myometrium do not work really. The issue is give it in the blood because the blood will distribute it there. So the drugs are meant for, they're meant for IMOIV use. However, some doctors okay. out of- That is very clear. The, maybe another colleague had asked, what is the order of giving the drugs? I think, uh, I shared a, a protocol with the, the BHF team on how to decide to move from the drugs to surgery. That protocol is there, and I think they will share it with you. It's based on monitoring, as opposed to monitoring blood loss, but monitoring the blood pressure and the pulse. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Musana, uh, for this wonderful Thank presentation. You. And I know we shall make a difference in the various communities that we are working in within the Busoga region. Um, at this point, I'd like to call upon Dr. Isaac Mubezi to give the closing remarks uh, for this CME. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carlo, for this wonderful moderation. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Musana for creating all this time to come and enlighten us on uh, PPH and its management. I would love to thank you, the audience, for also spending your time. Uh, I know it is, uh, you know, it, it is right now at nine, and many of you have responsibilities, but. You've, you've taken off your time to listen to this presentation. We can't take it for granted. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, it is very important that we prevent our mothers from dying from preventable causes. Uh, with this, allow me on behalf of uh, Busoga Health, Health Forum to present to you, Dr. Musana, this certificate of appreciation for your time and uh, elaborate presentation. And in Thank the you, same line, uh, yes, in the same line, allow me present to you on behalf of uh, Busoga Health Forum, uh, Dr. Karen Oleo, uh, this certificate uh, for your wonderful moderation of this session that has taken us an hour. Please receive it uh, from us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and with all that said, uh, we want to thank you again. Every Friday, same time, uh, invite many to come. And hey, before, before I forget, uh, Dr. Musana, uh, we appreciate that you've taken the courage to start to stand for, you know, uh, this campaign to be the president of the Uganda Medical Association, and it is on this request that uh, I request the members of the Busoga Health Forum that we give uh, Dr. Musana our support as uh, we go and uh, vote uh, in the Uganda Medical Association General Assembly. Thank you. Okay. Thank Hello. you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, mine is not like a question, but I would like to ask uh, how do we get such?